The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So, uh, yeah, but today what we want to do is talk about uh, evolution. Uh, and in particular, we're going to complete our discussion of evolution in the presence of clonal interference when multiple mutant lineages are competing uh, in the population at the same time. And then we'll move on to try to think about evolution on uh, these so-called rugged fitness landscapes. And so such ruggedness occurs when there are, uh, there are interactions between uh, the mutations within the organism. So so-called epistatic interactions can uh, perhaps constrain the path of evolution. Right? So we'll, we'll uh, complete our discussion of, of Roy Cashoni's paper on the equivalence principle in the presence of clonal interference. Then we'll say something about how clonal interference uh, slows down the rate of evolution. It slows down uh, the rate at which the population can increase in fitness right, because of this competition between different beneficial lineages. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll discuss this uh, paper by um, Daniel Weinreich, which uh, I think for many of us uh, had a real important effect in just terms of getting us to think about evolution uh, in a different way. Right, any questions before? Yes? Ah, yes. Uh, in case you've tried to forget, we have uh, an exam again uh, next week. Right? So research and education indicates that the more exams, the better. So if that makes you feel any better in terms of the uh, process, then use that. All right, so um, next Thursday, 7 o'clock, uh, we will announce the room um, later. All right. Did you have a question about that? Uh, yeah, so it will, be, uh, it will be weighted towards the material that we did not test through exam one. But you can expect to get two plus or minus one questions on material that was, uh, that was covered in the first uh, part of the class. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so coming back to this uh, discussion of, uh, of the equivalence principle. Uh, right, so th in the, the, the last figure of the paper, so figure four, uh, illustrated some uh, alternative underlying distributions. So what, so what we wanted to know is, all right, you know, so there are going to be some beneficial mutations that, th that these uh, E. coli can get in this new environment. Right? And they're going to be distributed according to some probability distribution. Right? So what we, in principle, want to know is this distribution of effects of beneficial mutations. So the probability distribution, p beneficial, is a function of s. All right. And uh, wh what was the, kind of the scale of uh, beneficial mutations that they observe in, in the paper? Right? How, how, how much better do the populations get after these few hundred generations? Hmm? All right, so order percent, it, yeah, a few percent, right? Um, precisely. And indeed, they had three different models for some, sort, some of the underlying distributions and how they might behave, right? So they had the exponential, uh, uniform, and uh, the Dirac kind of delta function, okay? Now, the question is, uh, and in, in, all the, in all these cases, are, are those the only three possible underlying distributions? That, you know, it could, you know, those are just kind of, Typical distributions, right? What you want uh, in this case is you, know, you want these three different distributions to somehow be qualitatively different so you can drive home the point that you can, in, in principle, describe the results of their uh, evolution experiment via uh, you know, wildly different underlying distributions. Okay? Now, uh, the, in all these cases, you, you have to specify the mutation rate. as well as the mean selection coefficient. Right. All right, so the mean of this distribution. Okay. Now the question is, uh, can we get any, uh, any intuitive insight into why there were the patterns that they observe in terms of the mutation rate that they had to assume and the mean selection coefficient 
that they, uh, well, right, they got, they had to, there was some region of parameter space for those two distributions, for each of those distributions that were kind of consistent with their data. Okay. All right. So in particular, there, there was a mutation rate mu for uh, exponential, for the exponential distribution, a mutation rate for the uniform, and a mutation rate for the delta, um, for the delta function. Okay. And also, there was a mean s okay, associated with the exponential, mean s for the uniform, and again, a mean s for the delta. Right. OK, so in, in, th in this case, um, they wanted to compare these three distributions. They were all, each of them were specified by two parameters, right? Because they, you know, you could come up with other underlying distributions that might, for example, have a larger number, that might be specified by a larger number of parameters, but then it's harder to compare uh, the quality of the fit and so forth, right? So they chose um, these three distributions just because this is somehow the rate that these new mutations will appear in the population. And then this tells us something about how good those mutations are. Right. Now, uh, some of you have the paper in front of you, and that's OK. But based on our understanding of how the clonal interference kind of manifests itself in terms of leading, eventually, you know, they, they have the, the log of the fraction. Right? That, you know, so this the fraction starts out 50-50. Log, OK, f1 over f2, right? So like, Cyan and yellow, say, right. So this thing starts out here, and then somebody in one side gets beneficial mutation, so it kind of comes up. Right, so they're they're measuring they measure the slope, for example, of uh, the lineage that is taking over the population. Okay, all right. So they want to know, all right, well, which of these kind of distributions and associated parameters will be able to explain the range of different trajectories that they saw. And so the question is, can we order these things? Right? And why? Right? Which one of these should be the largest, second largest, third largest, and so forth? Okay. Now, uh, it's OK if you just, well, if you have the paper in front of you, you can just read it off. But then, uh, but ultimately, you're going to have to be able to explain why it is that one is larger than the other. Okay. So what I want to know is, for example, at what order should these things come in? All right. So what I want to do is let you think about it for a minute, and then we're going to vote by putting our cards from high mutation rate to low mutation rate among A, B, and C. Yes. Like, so the means are constrained to be the same? OK, right. So they're not necessarily. So it's really going to be some range of parameters on each of these. And so the question is, why is it that on the range of parameters that are consistent with what they observe experimentally, that these things have some order? Are there any other questions about the question? Um, I'll give you 30 seconds to think about what the mutation rates should kind of be in this situation. So you're going to put the highest mutation rate up high, the lowest mutation rate down there, and the middle one in between. Yeah.
Do you need more time? All right, let's see where we are. Uh, and it's OK if you're just, if, if you're confused or don't know what I'm trying to ask. Uh, but let me, let me see kind of where, where the group is. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so it's, I would say it's pretty, all right, pretty much all over the place, whether people have, are voting something in reality or not. OK. Um, OK, right, so uh, right, the, the situation is that we have the data, which is shown in figure 3a, which is a bunch of these things that kind of look like this. All right. Okay, so we have some times, we have some slopes. We want to know how can we, under, how can we understand that data that we get out. Right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a model in which we say, all right, we're going to start with this population that's all identical. And then we're going to allow some mutations to accumulate. And we're going to let them compete against the, each other. And then see what happens at the other. So there's going to be some, again, distribution of slopes and so forth. Right? To what degree does this sort of data constrain that underlying distribution? Right? Between something that looks like an exponential, something that has a uniform distribution, and something that is a delta function. Right? So that's the exponential, so the delta, and this is the uniform. Yeah, it, it, it could. That's right. So the, this thing could turn around at various times, right? So, um, so I think that there are a number of different ways that you could argue about the right way to do this. In practice, I think it's not going to be very sensitive because there's a minority of, of them that will actually be turning around, for example. Uh, right? So you could, for example, just say all of the trajectories that cross some point, I'm going to look, measure the slope. And I think that, that would be sufficient. If you if you don't see the fraction, like in the sense that's right. So even if you don't even if you don't see these these things that do you know like the flatten out for example, then you could still have clonal interference, right? Because the slope might still be steeper than it sh than it would be in the absence of clonal interference. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, let you discuss with a neighbor for one minute. And then, uh, we, then we'll maybe discuss as a group. Because I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to try and, and verbalize their thought process. And if we discuss in a group, then only a few of us get to. Yeah? All right, so one minute. Try to, commit, try to discuss it with your neighbor. And then we'll uh, reconvene. As, yeah.
Yeah, and we're going to discuss the means in a moment. So indeed, the, these distributions will not end up having the same mean s. What are you controlling? That we're, what we're controlling is that the, we're asking about what range of parameters for each distribution will adequately fit the data. Yeah, the, it depend on what you get the, the data will be basically the, the initial slopes here and when they, to, when they deviated from a 50-50 mixture. Okay. All right, so that's what they're plotting is those histograms. All right, so it seems like we've, uh, we've quieted down, which means that we've, we've, we're, we've, we all agree on the answer is that no. OK, well, no, th I think that th this is actually pretty tricky. So yeah, that's fine. I just want to see where we are, though. All right, uh, reconfigure your cards. Your best guess for the orders of the mutation rates between uh, exponential uniform and delta. All right, ready? Three, two, one. OK, so we're, we're um, migrating towards some things. OK. Um, Great. And what, um, can somebody ver verbalize why they, what, um, the answer that they, their group got? So for our answers, A, B, and C. Okay. Okay. So we actually underestimate the mutation rate from the data. Underestimate. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I, I can see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, so the idea is that you're saying that we don't see an awful lot of the mutations here, right? Which means that the true mutation rate, the underlying mutation rate, is somehow much larger than you would have thought by based on the mutations that you actually see or something, right? And there, there may, there's maybe another, okay, right, so they're are different. All right. Um, Okay, so it's certainly along, it's certainly, re yes, I mean, it's, it's true, and then of course there are different ways of saying this. Yes? Yeah, um, same answer, but a slightly different way yeah. of thinking about it. Um, if, you're, if you're just randomly sampling any of these distributions, then uh, your, your sample drawn from the exponential uh, distribution is going to be low selection coefficient uh, more often than it's going to be for the other ones, like the delta. Is That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time uh, the uniform, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be equally, uh, right. equally likely to be a high selection coefficient as opposed to a low selection mm -hmm. coefficient. But with the exponential distribution, it's most likely to be a low selection coefficient. So you want more mutations. That's right. You somehow need more mutations of that exponential in order to sample out there, right? So which one is going to have a more clonal interference? Well, yeah, which of these distributions will end up having the most clonal interference after you fit? The data. Yeah. The one, the, the one with the highest mutation rate kind of has to, yeah. Um, of course, and even though some of those mutations are going to be lost, still it's going to have the most clonal interference there. And indeed, if the underlying distribution we're modeling as as a delta function, right? You know, and and in their in their fit, what they what they got was that uh, this this might be you know around. Five and a half percent, I think, is what they. Yeah. So yeah, you know, five, five. Okay. So here, this guy was around zero point zero five five. We'll say you know between five, five and a half percent. Okay. All right. So one, what they're saying is, all right. Well, you could model, you could explain all of our data just by assuming that there's some mutation rate where 
periodically, some individual gets a beneficial mutation that is 5, 5.5%. Right? And that could, in principle, be used to explain the base features here, that um, how long you have to wait before anything happens, and the slope when something starts happening. Right? So the histogram that they plot in the, is actually somehow this initial, this initial slope once you start seeing it deviate from 50-50. Okay? Right? But their, their point is that that does not prove that the underlying distribution is a delta function with some mutation rate. And indeed, to explain the data with a delta function, you don't, act, you don't need any um, clonal interference. Right? You just say, OK, well, somebody gets a mutation. It's 5%, and eventually he's going to spread. And that's what we see. If you want to explain the later dynamics of flattening out and so forth, then you have to allow, for, then you really have to, then you have to allow the other lineage to get a, a mutation as well to cause a flattening, right? But as far as the base dynamics of when you leave the 50/50 and the initial slope, you don't even really need to have any clonal interference to explain to explain their data with a delta function underlying, right? And that's why you also can get by with a very low mutation rate because you don't really need much in the way of competing lineages. Yeah. So, but what if the slopes are different? Like, how can you? How can you yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. So you you're not actually going to get the true distribution of slopes, but um, but their argument is that um, you know some you know that you know, a lot of that could just be noise and measuring the slopes and so forth. Yeah. Because if everything is a delta function, then you would you would start out by just getting one one slope, unless you unless you allow for multiple mutations on a lineage, and then you could, things could get more complicated. But um, yeah, in this case. All of these guys would have the same slope, okay, but that's that's at least uh, you know a reasonable first order approximation to the data. Okay? Um, however, as you move to these distributions, the uniform and exponential, you're going to need more and more clonal interference to kind of explain the data. So you're going to need higher and higher mutation rate. Okay? What's interesting is that you also have a lower and lower mean s. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, and I think that drawing these, drawing these underlying distributions is really helpful. Okay. So first, we're going to draw the delta function. That kind of makes sense that you can fit everything just by assuming 5, 5.5%. Right? So what we're going to do is okay, draw the various p. So I drew those distributions, but they weren't necessarily to scale, i.e., they didn't necessarily have the proper mean selection coefficient. Okay. What we can do here is we can draw. This is the mean s of the delta function, which was 5, 5.5%. Right? We get this guy here. Okay. Now the question is, can we describe the data using the same, um, well, using a uniform distribution with the same mean selection coefficient? All right, so we're going to we're going to have you vote yes and no and if you say no then you have to say what what's going to go wrong. Right? So the question is can can we just use the same mean selection coefficient for the for our uniform distribution? So you only ever measuring one type? Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to measure like the experiment where we we have say 96 different evolutionary trajectories where we measure the time that it takes for something to happen and then the initial slope. And we're going to take a histogram of those things and compare it between what we would get in the model with what we got in the data, you know, experimentally. Okay. All right. Question is, can we use the same mean s for uniform as we did for the delta function? And if you say no, you have to say why not. Okay. A is yes, B is no. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we have a bunch of no's, you know, maybe a few yeses. All right, but then some of the no's, all right, so as it, you know, it's incumbent on you then, well, I guess, oh, I don't know. So, yes, so one of the no's, why not? Well, if we have the same, if it has the same average, then there are going to be outliers that are far better for the self. That's right. So the problem here is that if we use the same mean selection coefficient for the um, for the uniform, then what we're going to end up with is something that comes out twice as far, right? Wait, but uh, the delta function is just the uniform distribution with zero. Yeah. So, but 
So you could always just spin it with. Yeah, we're assuming it's a uniform distribution that starts at zero and then goes out to some amount. Yeah. Um, right. So the idea is that no, but I, okay, whatever. That that's the model. You know, and I think it's a it's a it's a it's a reasonable model because we know that mutations, there are a lot of mutations that are that have little effect. So it, it makes sense for a distribution to start at zero, right? Um, if you're gonna have something like a uniform, right? And the problem with such a uniform distribution is that because there's going to be some clonal interference, what that means is that you're going to be kind of weighted out here. And that means that you'll kind of see mutations that are out here around 10% instead of around 5%. Okay. So what you actually want then is something where the mean selection coefficient is around half of what you had as the delta function. Okay. So you want something that really looks more like this. Okay. And that's actually why if you look at the data, uh, or if you look at the, this figure, then the, um, the uniform, the area that works for the uniform distribution has a mean selection coefficient of 3%. Okay? So this thing comes out to around 6% here, so just beyond the, uh, the S corresponding to the delta function. Right? So this is the delta, and this is the uniform. Okay, so here is around 6%. And the mean of this is, is had half of that. Right? What's happening is that there's some clonal interference. And you only need, you only need a modest amount of clonal interference, right? Because if you sample from a uniform distribution just a few times, then the most fit one will be around here, right? And it'll already be relatively peaked. You know, and of course, there's also this issue about uh, that you have to survive stochastic extinction. So that, all, that amplifies the effect further, right? So really, if you just have, you know, say, two mutations, Sampled from the uniform that survives stochastic extinction, you're already going to get you're already going to get something that's peaked around there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. But what if the mutation rate is low? You know, like I, I don't really understand. Like, okay. Well, okay. Right. So then the question is, what exact mutation rate do you need? And and basically, what you, um, you need enough, you need a high enough mutation rate that you get some mutations and that you can have some clonal interference, but uh, and the question is, what prevents you from getting, from having a mutation rate that's too high? No, Maybe no. My question is, like, uh. why do you need clonal interference to explain this data? Ah, right. And th that. I mean, of course, of course, like you have these weird dynamics, but if you focus on what happened early on. That's right. Then yeah. Right. Okay. So, and there it comes down to how peaked this distribution of slopes is, right? I because right, there are very few s shallow slopes. And of course, then it gets into the questions about quality of data and so forth, right? but that's, and that's more subtle. Right? But certainly, in, in principle, uh, in the absence of clonal interference, you would have some fair number of, of shallow slopes. I mean, it, wouldn't, it would be underrepresented just because of the stochastic extinction business. But still, you need some to, to explain the, the sort of peakiness of that distribution, of the slope distribution. Right. Now, the, the exponential is interesting because it's in a very, very different regime. Okay, because the mean, all right, so I just want to show, all right, so that this is mean s for the uniform. And actually, if, if, you, look at the, um, if you look at the figure, the, the mean s for the exponential is down there around 1%, okay. which is a little bit surprising. Because what this is saying is that if you look at this distribution, this initial slope kind of extends down here. And, it, and you have something that falls off dramatically there, right? Okay. So how is it possible that, th that you could use such a distribution that's peaked over here, that's you know, so far over on the left, and still explain the same data? Yeah, I mean, this is really tough. It's just that the tail of the exponential keeps on going. That's right. So it's true that I've drawn this kind of around 0, but you know. The exponential principle goes to infinity. It's just that it falls off exponentially. But what this means is that you're sampling pretty far out on the exponential in order to get the same mean effect. Right? So you're actually going out to 5 or 6 times this characteristic s. Right? So you're talking about e to the minus 5. Right? That means there's a lot of clonal interference that has to be happening in order to explain this. Right? But why is it that it's way over here on the, I mean, why not just use an exponential that kind of with a more with an s that's more like three, four, five, six percent. What's that? 
Well, I was like, okay, but you know, I mean, this is this is just a model. I can do whatever I want, right? Because this actually they 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 fit their data with these models, right? So uh, realistic is just means that it, it explains their data. There's you know, so there, there's nothing in, a priori wrong with saying, oh, here's an exponential with a distribution of with a characteristic fall off of five percent. That's in principle, fine. I mean, it doesn't work for some reason, but we have to figure out why. Right. Yeah? You're still most likely to get a very small selection coefficient because the mean is higher. OK, right. So you're, you're, you're likely going to get a, a low selection coefficient? OK. Um, is that the problem? Or? So that means you're getting a higher mutation rate. So if you have a high mutation rate and a high mean, then the penalty should be able to match that data. That, OK, that's true. But I guess the question is, um, but I guess you know, why why can't we use two mutations too close to each other? What do you mean? They have them tied between two mutations that may have maybe established as too close. Uh, okay, the time between two. Okay, that's an interesting statement. Although the 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 region of parameter space that they claim works is actually a region where we have uh, really high mutation rate. Orders of magnitude higher than the other two distributions. So in that sense, the time between mutations being established is really small. Okay, because we're in the because they're they're saying that oh, if you want to fit the data with an exponential, then you have to assume lots of clonal interference. So that means the time between successive establishments of mutations is really actually very short. Okay, so there that's actually the regime where they say they claim works, right? So the question is why is it that we can't go to this other regime? Why is it that you know, in this figure that they make, why is it that the mean, the allowed mean selection coefficient doesn't extend out to over there? Yeah. In that case, you would need to have a lower mutation coefficient, and you have not enough clonal interference to get the peak. Right. Because the exponential is peaked at low s, whereas what you observe is that's right. high s. Yeah, that's right. So, you, and the point is that to get to explain their data, you need something to cause this distribution to get more peaked over here, which means you need to have a fair amount of clonal interference, right? Which, but that means you need to have a, sm a small, sorry, you need to have a, a high mutation rate. But once you have that high mutation rate, if you have an, an exponential that comes out here, then you would actually sample way out here as well, right? So the only way to get a peaked distribution around here is to have it so that the exponential is really suppressing those really good mutations, but you have, um, but you have a lot of clonal interference that kind of pulls things out. Now there still is a fair range of, of uh, measurement or of, of parameters that work here. You know, it goes from say half a percent up to maybe one and a half percent in terms of this mean selection coefficient, and the mutation rate that uh, that works then changes, right? So as you go to a larger mean selection coefficient, the uh, mutation rate that is compatible goes down because you need less clonal interference, right? So that's why if you look at this figure for um, the region that works, right, in terms of the mutation rate for the beneficial mutation and the mean s, there's, there's some region that looks kind of like this that works for the exponential. And, and this is actually a, a big range. All right? So this is actually a factor of 100 in mutation rate that would be compatible. And then a factor of maybe 3 in, in mean selection coefficient. All right? So there, there's some range of parameters that work. And you can understand why it is that this thing has to be shaped kind of the way it is. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Right, because the uniform is out here, and then the delta function is here. So this is delta, uniform, um, and exponential. And you're just saying that it all kind of follows. Yeah. Is that, yeah? Um, Yeah, well, you know, maybe you know, maybe some power law fall off would kind of do that. Okay. But then what if you're no, there's, no, there's nothing magic about these these three regions. And, you know, and it's and it, it's not that we're claiming that you know the that the mean selection coefficient cannot be in here because right? we've just it's just that if you pick these three underlying distributions, you get this range of different 
values that would work. So if you chose other underlying distributions, you, would, you could get other blobs. Right? But it's true that there is a general trend that the higher the mean selection coefficient, the less clonal interference you, you need or want to explain the data. Right, why can't it go higher or lower? Yeah, um, I don't know. A factor of 100 isn't enough for you? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a good question. I, um, I'd have to think about it to figure out you know, which, because it's going to be a different effect on each side, presumably. Um, yeah, and, and all of these distributions, I mean, there's some floor, just because we know that, the, that you have to get these beneficial mutations you know, within the first few tens of generations. Otherwise, you, the, uh, the mutation wouldn't have gotten a chance to spread when it did. Right? So that means we know that there, there's going to be a lower bound on the mutation rate always, because if it's, if it's too low, then we, just wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten the mutations in time. Right? And now, in terms of why it can't be higher, um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to think about it. Um, are there any other questions about, um, about this paper? I think it's, it's a challenging paper kind of conceptually slash mathematically. But, it, but it, I think it's interesting because it does get you to think about this process of clonal interference in new ways. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that I mean, the mutation rates that, right, so th first of all, this is not a per base pair mutation rate. This is the rate that you get beneficial mutations, right? So this is, um, so, you know, it's n I'd say the numbers are not ridiculous, but it's not that you can just take the, no the known per base pair mutation rate and say, oh, well, it has to be here, because um, an awful lot of them are deleterious, you know, and then, and it's very sensitive because the, the mutations that are occurring around here don't really matter for evolution because uh, they tend not to survive stochastic extinction. They're not going to survive clonal interference. Yet it could be a big part of the distribution, right? It could be that, that the majority of the mutations, for example, in the, in the exponential, is there, right? And so you can actually have very different distributions that don't really change the evolutionary process but would change the rate of beneficial mutations, right? So I think that it's. Um, the, the, the numbers are not ridiculous, but it's, it's hard to constrain, actually. Because yeah. okay. okay. what I, I want to do is, um, before talking about these rugged fitness landscapes and the Weinreich papers, just say something about, um, about the rate of evolution. Okay? So l let's imagine the simple, and, and, and when we say rate, we're referring to the the, the change in the mean fitness of the population with respect to time. Okay. All right, so this is the rate of evolution. All right, so this is the change in the mean fitness. Okay. Delta delta mean fitness divided by delta time. Right, so what, uh, what we want to do is just start by thinking about a situation where uh, we assume that we're not at all running out of, of new mutations that are, that are good for us. Right, so what we can do is just assume that at some rate mu, right, so there's uh, at rate mu beneficial, we'll say, we, we sample from some probability distribution of beneficial mutations. Okay, and then um, and, and then, right, something happens, stochastic extinction, maybe clonal interference, whatnot. Uh, but some of them will fix, and then that increases the fitness. And then for now, we'll just assume that, uh, that the fitness is add. Okay. But for small s's, it doesn't matter whether we're thinking about fitnesses adding or, or multiplying. Um, do you guys understand what, I'm sa what I just said there? So if you, if you get a mutation um, that has effect s1, it may be that the right way to think about this is that if you get a mutation S2, then it, the fitnesses perhaps should multiply as the null model. But you know, this is, of course, for small S1 and S2, this is around 1 plus S1 plus S2. Okay, so for, for small S's, for short times, maybe we don't need to worry about this. Um, because this is, you know, 
for S1 and S2 much less than 1. Right? Okay. Yes? That's right. Uh, so eventually, that's certainly going to be the case, that, uh, that we're going to run out of these, of these beneficial mutations. But uh, for the first you know, couple, few thousand generations, it's roughly, roughly linear. So eventually, it does, it does start curving over. But, um, but not, maybe not as fast as you would have thought. Yeah. Okay. So what we just want to at least, you know, and, and at least, at the very least, this is a, a good no model, and then we can, we can, of course, complicate things later, right? But for now, we'll just assume that you always sample from the same probability distribution of beneficial mutations, just for simplicity. Okay? The question is, how fast will the fitness of the population increase with time? Okay? Do you guys understand the question? All right, let's start by thinking about the regime where mu b um, n is much less than 1. Right, so um, very, um, very low rates of evolution, or ro low rates of mutation relative to the population size. Um, now, you might recall, OK, just to, for clonal interference, right? Um, so clonal interference not relevant. What we found last time was it required that the time that it took for, uh, for a mutation to fix had to be much less than the time between successive establishments right, of, of these beneficial mutations. Right? And this was 1 over s log ns. You should be able to derive both of these, this and that, and this, and the next step as well. Okay. All right, so this is, the, you can ignore clonal interference if this is true. All right. So let's say, um, Right, so let's say that we can ignore clonal interference. Okay. So for small population sizes or in the limit of low mutation rates. Okay. What we want to know is the rate of evolution. How will it scale with various things? Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and have us vote for, OK. How does it scale with in particular both the mutation rate and the population size? Okay. All right. So it's proportional to what? Holding another thing is constant. Holding, for example, the distribution and n constant. Okay. Do you understand? The, do you understand the question? Yes. Okay. So this is just the the rate of beneficial mutations, and this is just to the zeroth power, i.e., it doesn't depend. Oh, okay. Right. Linearly squared. Yeah. Okay. All right, ready? Yeah, assuming that clonal interference is not relevant. So, assuming for, for a small mutation rate, how does it scale with mutation rate? Okay, ready? Three, two, one. 
All right, so we got a lot of Bs, which is nice. Okay. So this is saying that, indeed, if, if mutation rate is small, then um, there's just going to be some rate that mutations enter into the population. They may or may not survive stochastic extinction. But you know, if they do, and that doesn't depend on mutation rate, then uh, they, um, they, can, they can fix. And in this low mutation rate regime, they, they don't compete with each other. Right? In which case, uh, if you double the rate that these things enter into the population, you'll double the rate that they get established. And you'll double the rate that these beneficial mutations will fix in the population. So you double, you double the rate. Okay. All right. Now, as a function of n, does it go as n to the 0? Or other? OK, a, b, c, d. All right, I'll give you 15 seconds to think about it. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. OK, so now we're getting m more disagreement. All right, um, and it's I'd say largely A's and B's. Um, right, there's enough disagreement. Let's go ahead and, and spend uh, you know just 30 seconds. Turn to your neighbor. Per individual, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and, uh, and re-vote just so I can see where we are. Okay. Uh, how is it that the rate of evolution in this regime, no clonal interference, how is it going to scale with population size? Ready? Three, two, one. OK, so I'd say that we have not really convinced each other of anything. All right, so uh, OK, A's or B's? Uh, somebody what, uh, explain the reasoning. Okay. Population. All right. So if you double the size of the population, you'll double the rate that new mutations enter into the population. But the, 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 and, and, and the other important thing is that the fixation time just goes like log of that. Okay. Right. So then there's the fixation time business. So how does that? How does? How is that relevant? Or, yeah. So, yeah. Some somebody that said a. Why, why, um, what was what was your partner's reasoning? Or were you convinced by this argument? More confused. Well, if, if it's new to initialization, then the heavily fixation can go as long as we're adding fixation as well. Ah, right. So if it's a nearly new neutral mutation, then, um, then it's true that the probability fixation would be 1 over n, but? But if n is very large, then it's, you know, if n times less will not be that. OK, right. If n, yeah, but now you're invoking n being large, which I don't think we necessarily want to do. Um, I mean, I guess there are a couple things to say there. Um, one is that it, it's the mutations that are n really nearly neutral will not have a very significant effect on, um, on, on the fitness, right? Um, and, and within that regime, I think, yeah, you'd have to, um, you'd have, yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to check, you know, what happens there, right? But um, 
But I think that for, you know, in, in most of these cases, when we, you know, it's a small population, we're often saying, oh, population might still be 10 to the 4 or so, right? In which case, the nearly neutral mutations are not really the relevant, are not very relevant, right? So indeed, over a broad range of conditions in this situation, it's going to scale as n, all right? So the rate, okay, so the rate, okay, so far, it's going to be equal to, there's a mu b times an n, OK? But now, all right, and, that, and that's basically because the rate the new mutations enter into the populations is mu n, right? And the rate that they uh, get established is just mu n s. This is indeed what this calculation is telling us, OK? Now the question is, how much of a fitness gain will we get? OK, how is it going to scale? With, these, with this probability distribution, OK? So this probability distribution will give us some function of s, OK? So we want to know how, you know, so this, this distribution has to be relevant. Do we agree? OK, so we want to know in what way is it relevant, OK? Is it relevant via the mean, via the mean squared, the mean cubed, I don't know, um, the mean squared or other. This, this one is harder, so it's worth spending, I'll give you, I'll give you a full 30 seconds to think about it. All right, so the question is, how is it that the probability distribution will enter into the, the rate of evolution in this situation? OK. Question. I'm sorry, what, multiple yeah, what? Yeah, is it possible that it enters in multiple ways? Oh, um, yeah, you know, this is why I gave you flashcards. You know, you can put, put up any combination you want. All right. Um, all right. Another 15 seconds. This, this, one, this one is trickier. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and vote. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we got a lot of A's and B's, some maybe C's and D's, but it's it's. All right, so it, yeah, okay, we're we're pretty far. Okay, we're okay, we're we're all over the place. All right, so um, okay, so okay, so there's going to be some distribution. Okay, that might be, for example. Probability distribution is function of s. It's function of s. We want to know. Okay, it's going to be something that's going to fall off in some way. Maybe exponential. Maybe something else. Right. Now, to keep track of this, what we need to do is remember that the probability of establishment goes as s. Right. The probability of establishment. Well, and in, in this, in the Moran model, is equal to s. In other models, it might be two s, but it, you know, it's around s. Um, and then the um, and then the question is, how much of a benefit will you get if you do establish? Right? And that is, again, going to go as um, and the del whatever the delta fitness is actually, again, equal to whatever s it is that you sampled. Right? And the given mutation that appeared, it ha you, know, you sample somewhere, it has to, do bo it has to both survive and well, right. If it survives, then it gives you an S, right? So what that means is that actually you end up averaging S squared of the distribution to um, to determine the rate uh, the rate of evolution. Okay, rather than because I think what you would have if if it was just a delta function at S, then it would then it's just an S squared. So then you kind of think, oh, it's going to be mean of S squared, right? But if it's a delta function, then the mean of S squared and the mean S squared are the same thing. Right, um, but in this situation, it's just useful to play with some different distributions and kind of see um, see how it um, how it plays out. Okay, but in in this case, it is indeed mean 
s squared. All right, so the rate of evolution in the limit of um, in the limit of, of no clonal interference is actually rather simple. Okay, just goes as mu n, but then you have to take uh, the expectation of s squared of whatever this distribution is of um, underlying mutations. Okay. All right, but of course this is going to break down at some point, as everything does. Um, and and uh, can, just can somebody remind us why it is that it's going to break down? Clonal interference, perfect. Um, and we, we know exactly where clonal interference is going to start being relevant here. In particular, what we can imagine drawing is something that's the rate of evolution as a function of n. So rate is a function of n. And we might even want to do plot in a log log scale. Okay, So we'll say uh, the log of the rate, the log of n. And at the beginning, this is going to be, is it, yeah, what, what do I draw here for small n? A line with slope 1. OK. If it, if it had depended on n squared, then what would I be drawing here? A line with slope 2. Yeah, don't mess that up because it's really easy to. OK, so it's line with slope 1, right? So at the beginning, if you double the pop, you know, for small population size, if you double the population size, you should double the rate of evolution. But this can't go on forever, and it won't. So it's going to curve over somewhere, right? How can, and, get, how can the rate go down? Because all right, so the rate goes, the rate, okay. Yeah, so the rate goes down relative to what it would have if it had continued, right? And that's because what, you're wasting some beneficial mutations. With clonal interference, what's happening is that uh, you have a great mutation over here, but also a great mutation over here, and only one of those great mutations can win, right? So, you're, so, that, so with clonal interference, you're somehow wasting some of the good, the beneficial mutations that you acquired, right? Even though you're like always taking the maximum. Because what you're doing is yeah. generating a bunch yeah, of Right, because the, alter the alternative would have been to, ta to take the sum of them. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right? Which is what happens over here. If, you, you know, if they're not competing, then you, know, you get one and you get the other, and you just get higher and higher. With clonal interference, you, take the, right, you, do, you, take, do, you indeed take the maximum, but that's lower than the sum. Right? Um, and, and that effect just gets worse and worse as you get to larger population sizes. Okay? So uh, although it's kind of very simple, or relatively simple, calculate the rate of evolution in the limit of small populations, the rate of evolution in the case of clonal interference is actually um, a very hard problem. Okay. Um, hard, well, experimentally, theoretically, and in all ways. Um, uh, you know, I just want to say a few things that, um, so that uh, there have been some really, I think, interesting studies occurring over the last 10 years uh, trying, trying to get at this regime. Right? So the question is, how, you know, how, how should it behave? And, um, there's a paper by Desai et al. Well, I'll just say Desai, Fisher, and Murray, uh, when they were all at Harvard. Um, since then, Daniel Fisher, the condensed matter theorist, has moved to Stanford. Desai went to Princeton, but then came back to Harvard. So he's now, uh, he's now Harvard faculty. So this is current biology. In 2006, 7, 8, 2007. And right, so they have, um, they have kind of a simplification of this, where they asked, let's just assume that we don't have a probability distribution of beneficial mutations. Instead, let's just assume that there's some mutation rate to acquire a beneficial mutation that's exactly s. Okay. So you'd say, all right, well, that sounds super simple, and of course it's not true. But even that problem is hard. Okay? But what they can do in this regime is that they then it's nice because everything is kind of discrete. Because then the, the population is going to be described by a series of, um, so this is, this is abundance as a function of the fitness. So this is maybe the bulk fitness 
you know, relative 0. Here, this is s, 2s, 3s, 4s. And, you know, and maybe there's a little bit here at 5s. Okay? So then what happens is that there's going to be some uh, equilibrium distribution of this front or the nose of the population. Okay? And at some rate, these guys get mutations where some individual kind of comes like this because it gets a mutation. It's beneficial. But you know, that doesn't actually affect the dynamics very much because all of these guys are growing exponentially. What's really relevant are when population, when individuals that have several or more of these beneficial mutations than the rest of the population, when these guys get a little mutation or get, get a mutation that they can move forward, right? And it's 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 this dynamic that is kind of pulling the population here, right? And so you can um, actually do analytic calculations on this model that you would not be able to do if you did a full distribution of mutations here. But it's actually still complicated and hard and I do not claim to have gone through the full derivation because the full thing is they get that the velocity in this model go approximately equal to, but then it's an s squared All right, so uh, you know you, you you know you might sneer at this model and say, oh well, you know this is an oversimplification, blah blah blah. But even this is hard, and it comes out you know you get a complicated expression, um, and I think it's it's describing something fundamental that's happening in these populations with clonal interference. The important thing is that um, you can more or less this this term is going to be the dominant one in many uh, in many cases, especially because we're interested in the large n regime here. So what you see is that. For large n in this model, and they did experiments in this paper that are consistent with it, um, they, they find that the velocity, the rate of evolution, okay, this is the rate. Okay, you see, here's the s squared term that we already talked about, right? And, if this, and there's no probability distribution, so it's just an s squared. But what you see is that it ends up going as log n for large n, right? So this is when there's a lot of clonal interference. So maybe this thing goes as log n. Okay, uh, but I'd say it's it's it maybe it, it, this is not an open and shut case because uh, real populations are more complicated than this because it's not that every mutation has magnitude s, but um, but I think it's a, it's a reasonable first order model and um, and I think this is a nice set of calculations to make sense of things. Okay, uh, are there any questions about that calculation or why this thing curves off? Other things? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So right. So that's okay. So the question is, why is it that it's average s squared instead of average s squared? And um, right. So what is it that's useful to say? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a nice probability distribution where those things will have um, very different. Um, For a, for a delta distribution, they're the same thing, right? So if we if we wanted to do um, uh, an intuitive explanation, maybe probably I'm trying to think if maybe if we had two delta distributions. What? Okay, so the mean s would be here. Yeah. Okay. So right. So imagine that that I know that this is not a real beneficial mutation. So maybe, but okay. But something that's small. Okay. You know, negligibly small here, and magnitude s over here. Right, so the mean s is indeed um, equal to this s naught over two, right? Um, whereas the mean mean of s mean of s squared is then s naught squared over four. Whereas the right is are we going to get something different? Oh no. Okay, I I. I think I'm going to have to come up with a better, ex a better example to answer you. So maybe, maybe after class we can come up with one. I don't want to take five minutes finding a good explanation. Yeah? How is the equation uh, mapped to the Okay. Yeah, so this, this is the rate of evolution yeah. um, in the regime of large population size. OK. okay. Um, and I don't know how small you have to go before funny thing, you know. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, but. Yeah, but that, that's only for the 
yeah, and of course, you can imagine that taking various limits is complicated here, right? But, um, but the important thing is that it's, it goes, you know, the rate goes as log n for, um, for in the case of clonal interference. I guess that's what I want to, um, that's, that's the key thing to maybe remember, besides the fact that, you know, they actually had to work to get to, do, to analyze this model. Um, okay, so what, uh, what I want to do is uh, just you know, in the last 10, 15 minutes to talk about this, um, this Weinreich paper because I think that it is, um, I think it's pretty. Uh, and, um, you know, and it, it's, I think it's an elegant example of how uh, if you look at a problem in a sort of different way, then you can get uh, what I think are really interesting insights um, using a minimal amount of, like, you know, Measurements, right? You know, I mean, how? I mean, basically, how many how many measurements did that are in this paper? Basically, thirty-two, right? So, um, right. So, what they're doing is they're analyzing mutations in the enzyme beta lactamase or the gene encoding beta lactamase, which confers resistance to beta lactam drugs like, in this case, cefotaxim. Okay, so this guy gives uh, resistance to. Um, to, the, to these beta lactam drugs that are like ampicillin or uh, penicillin, in this case, uh, cefotaxim. Okay, but not all of the versions of this gene or the enzyme actually can break down this, um, this new drug. Okay? So all 32 versions of the enzyme that they study um, break down, for example, ampicillin, but, uh, but they have widely varying uh, levels of resistance or ability to break down this uh, drug cefotaxim. Okay. And um, right, so they wanted to say, try to understand something about what happens if you start out with this, um, what the, the base version of the enzyme, what we normally, you know, if you just look up what's the sequence for beta lactamase, right? What, you know, what's going to be the sequence? And that, that we're, we're going to call the minus, 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 minus. Okay? Um, and we want to, we, you know, we might reasonably want to know how does it get to the version of the enzyme that has all five of these point mutations? Okay. Uh, does anybody remember what those five mutations were? I mean, like, what kind of mutations are they? They're all point mutations. And are they all protein coding mutations? No. So actually, this one here is actually a promoter mutation that increases expression by a factor of two or three. Whereas these things here are indeed protein coding and, uh, and change the amino acid protein coding. The amino acids in the end, you know, you know, well, they each change one amino acid in, in, the, um, in the resulting protein. Okay? Um, right, and so, so what, uh, what Weinreich in this paper was trying to understand is, you know, what is kind of the shape of these fitness landscapes? And what does that mean about um, the course of evolution or the repeatability or predictability of evolution. Okay. And I just want to stress, okay, this, this is the Weinreich 2006. Okay. Because this version of the gene slash enzyme is essentially unable to break down cefotaxim at all. Okay, so uh, E. coli that has this version of the enzyme, it's almost as if they don't have the en any enzyme at all. Whereas this version of the enzyme is able to break down this, uh, this drug, ceftaxim, uh, at very high rates. Okay? And indeed, the way that these things are quantified in this paper is via what's known as the MIC, or the minimum inhibitory concentration. Okay? And, and basically, you just ask in, oops, in, inhibitory concentration. You just ask, uh, what's the minimum amount of the antibiotic that you have to add to prevent growth of the bacterial population after 20 hours, starting from some standard cell density. Okay? So it's a very easy uh, experiment to do because in a 96 well plate, you just have many wells, and you just uh, go down in concentration, maybe by a factor of, of root 2 each time. So then you go across 12 or 24, and you get over a broad range of antibiotic concentrations. And what you should see is that. Um, this is maybe dividing by root 2 each time. So you get growth here, you get growth here, growth here, but then no growth, no growth, no growth. 
And the concentration that you added here is the MIC. What you'll see is that depending upon the version of the enzyme that the bacteria have, the growth will occur up to different, um, different concentrations. Okay? Why, why would you choose? Why would you? Why is that? Oh, I'm just telling you what they actually did experimentally in this paper. All right, yeah, you could do factor of two, or you know, it's just a question of how fine of a resolution you want. How to do root two? It's uh, <laughs> you're you're okay. You know, all right, okay. So <laughs> this is like a mathematician's question. All right, because um, because your point is going to be that you know. Okay, right. So root, it's true. Root two. It's an irrational number, right? You can, pr you know, it's the first proof in an analysis textbook. Um, doesn't matter. Okay, our error in pipetting is, you know, a percent, which means that, you know, if you do one point four, one, that's fine. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, so don't be paralyzed by pipetting a root two. Okay. Um, very sharp, this change in, in growth? Uh, you know, biology and the word always should never be used in the same sentence. Um, you know, I'd say that it's a reasonable assay. It's, um, it's typically sharp. It happens, though, that you get growth here and then you get stressed out because you don't know what to do. I mean, the, the, you know, the important thing is that you, um, you know, do the experiment multiple times and you have some reasonable rule for treating these things. And, yeah, it can be more complicated, though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. What we're going to use in the context of this paper, though, is we're just going to assume that this MIC is a measure for fitness. Okay. Um, the mapping from MIC to fitness is actually very non-trivial, something that my group has spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, but for the purposes of this paper, just when you hear MIC, you can just say, think of it as fitness. Okay. Higher MIC, we're, and, you know, he assumes um, that there's, it can be selected for by evolution. Right? So what do you, um, all right, so there uh, are, in principle, two to the five different states. Okay. Different versions of this gene. So what he did is he constructed each two to the five versions of the gene, put them into the same um, strain of E. coli and then measured the MIC of each of those 32 strains. Okay. And, then, and, then, um, and that was all the measurements in this paper, basically. Because right? everything else is just uh, analysis of that resulting fitness landscape. But I think that what's exciting about this is just the ability to have a, an experimental fitness landscape. Right? Because uh, we've talked about fitness landscapes for years, but then um, it, it tends to be much more like what you saw in, um, in Martin Novak's book, right? that you can Think about these fitness landscapes, and you can do um, you know, calculations of what should happen on them. Um, but this is a case where we can actually just measure something akin to a fitness landscape and try to say what it means. All right? So you can ask questions about you know, how rugged is the landscape, how many different paths can you take from this version to this version. Right? So first of all, uh, how, many, um, how many peaks were in this landscape that he measured? One peak, right? This is important. All right, this was the one and only peak. Okay, because you know, th in the, when you read this paper, you 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 come away thinking, oh yeah, this is a this is a really rugged landscape, right? Many of the paths were not allowed by so-called Darwinian or selective evolution, um, but it's it's easy to forget that actually it's not that it's a it's a moderately rugged landscape because there was still one peak. Okay, right. In particular. It, you know, if you would just assume that, that the population starts at that minus, minus, minus state, starts traveling uphill in fitness, gets a mutation, goes uphill, is there any possibility for it to get trapped in a non-optimal? No, right? Because there are no other peaks, right? Uh, so there's, if there's only one peak, that's the same statement, same thing as saying that you can take any path you like going uphill, and you will always get to the same final location. You will never get stuck anywhere, right? I mean, it does not mean that you can take any old path that you want. So many of the paths may be blocked in the sense that they may go downhill and so forth, right? But, there, um, but at any location that you're at, there's always at least one path going up in fitness, up in MIC, 
doesn't matter which path you take, you will always be able to get to the peak of this landscape. Okay? So it's not, it's not too rugged of a landscape in that sense. Yeah? So wasn't it that some paths were not at all precisely because Right, so some paths are not allowed in the sense that, you know, that some paths decrease fitness locally. But what I'm saying is that you can take a different path that goes up in fitness, and you'll still get to the same peak. Right. Like if you started in, in that long path, then you would step. Well, no, no, the thing is that you can't, uh, you can't take that path because that path goes down in fitness, is the claim. Right. So the, the statement from this paper is that, um, that if we just assume that the only mutations that can fix in a population are mutations that increase fitness, then it does not matter which, which of those beneficial mutations you take because you will always end up reaching the peak. And indeed, right, so there were 102, uh, okay, right, so there are 120 possible trajectories. Can somebody say how we get 120? Right, so this is 5 factorial, right? Um, what, what, what he found by analyzing the resulting fitness landscape is that 102 were selectively inaccessible. Oh, I don't know how many. Is that the right way to spell that? Yeah. Okay. Right. And and what he's assuming is that the only mutations that can fix are beneficial mutations. Okay. Uh, right. In particular, if you have two states, if there's a mutation that you could acquire. Let's say from here. Or let's say you get this mutation, and that just leads to the same MIC. He assumes that that is inaccessible. Right. You know, and of course, like all things, you can argue about it. What, he would, what he's saying is that you know, it's, it's, it won't fix in reasonable times, which is fair. If it's really a neutral mutation, in particular, if you have 10 to the 6 bacteria, and there are some mut if the mutation rates are the same everywhere, and some, of them lead, some mutations lead to significant increase in fitness, then a neutral mutation would be unlikely to fix. Right? So what he found is that there were only then 18 of the 120 paths up this fitness landscape that had monotonically increasing fitness values. Okay. Uh, and indeed, if you analyze those trajectories, what we found is that actually not only 18 is maybe even overstating things, because only a few of those trajectories would uh, likely occupy a majority of what you might call the actually observed paths, just because of the statistics of when those paths branch and so forth. Right, so the argument from this paper is that we can measure fitness landscapes. And from it, we can say something about the path of evolution, perhaps. Other people have since gone and done actually laboratory evolution on a different antibiotic resistance gene. Again, Roy Cashoni, actually, uh, to confirm that, that these landscapes, in, at least in some cases, can inform laboratory evolution. Um, so there is a sense that maybe evolution uh, is, is more predictable than you would have thought. Okay. Uh, we are out of time, but uh, if you have any questions, please Go ahead and come on up and I uh, will uh, and ask me. All right, thanks.